world sees me and sees a hateful monster in Onryo. My own mother saw it too. And could not love me. Blue Eye Samurai is one of those awesome TV shows we get every now and then. It's a dark and gritty tale about a young half Japanese half Caucasian woman called Mizu who is out on a blind journey of revenge against a couple of white men, one of whom is her father. You see there's just something about Mizu's character that always leaves me captivated every time I watch the series. There is so much depth and consistency to her as a person that sometimes it felt like her story was based on real events. For those of you who have watched Blue Eye Samurai, it should be clear to you that even even though Mizu is the protagonist of the show, she is definitely not the average hero. Today we will be taking a deeper look inside Mizu to try and shed more light on her actions and motivations as a character, why she did some of the stuff she did and maybe see if we can justify some of them. Okay so how I'm gonna do this is first I'm gonna summarize everything about Mizu from her childhood to the end of the first season of Blue Eye Samurai. Also, the events of her past were scattered throughout the season as flashbacks, but I intend to summarize everything in chronological order. After that, I will talk about key elements of her personality, so we can have a better understanding of our protagonist. Do keep in mind that there will be spoilers up ahead, so watch out and take care. And without further ado, let's take a deep dive inside Mizu, the vengeful Ronin. I'm a half-breed. Hardly human. Do it already. No! You see, from the very point of her inception, Mizu had been unwanted because during that time period, a majority of the Japanese population considered Europeans to be devils and despised everything Western. Unfortunately for Mizu, her father was white, and even though her mother was Japanese, she was born with blue eyes. So the very sight of her felt like a taboo to the Japanese locals. The first thought that ran across the minds of everyone at her birth was to get rid of her. Only by the death of one of her more adamant haters was she able to cling on to her life. This little scene holds a very important meaning to the life of Mizu because other than being very emotional and heart-wrenching, it also provides a huge background to Mizu's entire life. This moment right here was the very first time Mizu tasted human blood. Another thing I love about this short sequence of actions is the way Mizu reacts to the whole ordeal. You see, being a baby, Mizu doesn't really know what's going on at this point. So when the drops of blood fell on her face, the creators of the animation could have simply made her let out a cute innocent laughter. You know, being a baby and all, but instead they made her cry. This says a lot about Mizu because even though the death of that man is what kept her alive, she wasn't happy about it. And as we proceed with her story, we'll slowly come to realize that even though Mizu is extremely good at taking lives, it's not something she particularly enjoys doing, but more times than not, she just has to to stay alive, just like when she was a baby. Mizu also had a very hard time growing up. At the time of her birth, there were only four white men in Japan selling opium, one of whom must be her father. Since being mixed race was frowned on, her mother's maid was paid to take and hide her from the public. One thing to note here is that throughout the first season, the whereabouts of her real mother were not mentioned so I'm not sure if she's dead or still alive somewhere. It would be utterly insane if they later revealed that she returned with Mizu's father to Europe. That would be crazy. But anyway, Mizu spent her early childhood trapped indoors by the maid she assumed was her mother. The woman forbade her from ever interacting with anyone, constantly shaved the poor girl's hair and forced her to act like a boy because she had a bounty on her head. But even though the woman was usually hard on her, her, Mizu still grew to love her. Eventually though the money she was paid ran out and the maid got sick of the child. One day Mizu went outside and was seen so their house was burnt down. Mizu managed to escape but the maid who also got out of the house decided to fake her own death to get rid of the girl. Thinking she just witnessed the death of her mother and blaming herself for the misfortune, a traumatized Mizu vowed to take revenge on the white men whom she considered to be the true causes of all her suffering. This right here was the first and original reason why Mizu said out on her revenge journey, vengeance for her dead mother. Now I say the original reason because later on this will change. Now without a house or a mother to live with, Mizu took to the streets where she began scavenging for food, where she was constantly bullied by other kids for being biracial. It was during one of these encounters that she first came across Taigen. One night the bullying got so intense that the boys were ready to smash her with a big rock. But a blue meteor suddenly crashed near the children, scaring the bullies away and putting an end to Mizu's torment. 
Fortunately for our girl, a blind but renowned swordsmith called the Swordfather was passing by. He came closer to inspect the meteor and upon discovering that it was metal, decided to take it home. Mizu helped him with this and started staying with him, subsequently becoming his apprentice. While still harboring hopes of someday becoming a skilled warrior and exacting her revenge, as Mizu grew older, she began learning how to use a sword by watching clients of the Swordfather practice. And since all the swordsmen had to show their full techniques to the swordsmen, Smith in order to get their swords made. Mizu got to learn a lot from many different warriors. One time she even practiced with an assassin who came to get a sword under the guise of being a bereaved bookbinder. The man had come claiming to need the sword to avenge his father who was killed by a drunk ronin so he needed the sword to get his revenge. Mizu instantly bought the man's story but the sword father on the other hand in all his experience was skeptical and hesitant but after Mizu stubbornly expressed her support for the man the swordsmith eventually agreed to make the sword. During her practice with the assassin though, he was rather rough on her and assuming she was a boy, berated her for being too soft and tender. Since everyone already thought she was a boy and not wanting to be confined to the life of a woman in ancient Japan, Mizu decided to keep up the masculine act and began concealing her emerging boobs, a process I can only imagine to be painful but I really don't know. Meanwhile, after considering the amount of help she had offered him, the sword father decided to let Mizu make the sword for the assassin. She gladly accepts to do it, but it breaks upon completion. The man responds by slapping her and revealing his assassin identity as the blood-soaked Chiaki before leaving with the sword. This revelation rekindles Mizu's rage, making her more determined to accomplish her mission. After many years of sword making and practice, Mizu reaches a point in her life when she believes she's ready to set out on her journey of revenge. So she makes a sword with the blue meteor that once saved her life, gathers all the money she had been saving and bids the sword father farewell, much to his dismay. Because even though he had previously given her permission to practice sword fighting, the sword father had also hoped that she would eventually forget about going down such a dark path. But Mizu is adamant and proceeds anyway. Before I continue, I'd just like to state that everything I'm going to be talking about in this chapter of the video will be coming from the multiple flashbacks Mizu experiences in the fifth episode. I will try to do justice to the story, but I'm not gonna lie. The best way to enjoy this segment of the story is by watching the episode for yourself. Because what I'm doing is separating the past events from the present ones to produce a linear version of Mizu's story. But this episode is a combination of three stories from the past, present and future. And the way the episode flawlessly switches is a sight to behold. I'm sure those of you who have watched the show will agree with me. That said, let's get back to the video. Now armed with nothing but a sword and the knowledge of combat, Mizu finds the nearest opium dealer shop and politely asks about the Europeans who sold it to them. In response, the shopkeepers proceed to beat her up, stab her and throw her outside to die from her injuries. What's interesting about this scene is how it displays Mizu's inexperience with people and the outside world. Because at this point, Mizu is definitely a formidable fighter and could probably wipe the floor with the drug dealers, but they don't know that. And the way she carelessly approached the men made her look unintimidating. So of course they weren't gonna tell her secrets that could get them in trouble with the authorities. Another place something like this was done is Avengers Age of Ultron, when Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch came to question Claw about Vibranium. Sure, they had superpowers, but they weren't intimidating enough to make the experienced black market merchant talk. Not until Ultron arrived anyway. Okay, slowly bleeding to death, Mizu painfully walked around begging for help, but no one was willing to help her for obvious reasons. Just when she was about to lose all hope of survival, she stumbles upon a fake mother before passing out. Let me just say this right here. The number of times Mizu miraculously gets saved from some dire situation in this show is quite much and a bit funny in my opinion. But but anyway, her fake mom takes her home and tends to her wounds. The woman who seemed to be in her 50s was now living as a roadside hooker who spends all her money on opium. When Mizu inquires as to why she faked her death, she replies with some bullshit about it being for the best and that she knew Mizu would be impossible to catch on her own. Mizu who is simply overjoyed about reuniting with her mother isn't even mad at all and decides to start living with the woman. Mizu also told the old woman to quit the prostitute stuff because she had enough money to take care of them both. 
Remember when I said that the death of her mother was the original reason why Mizu even set out on her revenge journey in the first place? Well now that she was back with her mother, Mizu was ready to forget about everything and settle down. But this woman wanted violence. One day Mizu got up and realized that the old hag had stolen all her money. When she asks about it, the old woman simply tells her to forget about money because she had found Mizu, a husband, a rich but disgraced ronin named Mikyu who was getting old and required a wife to help him out in his lonely home. This news does not sit well with Mizu at all. The maid then reminds Mizu that she is still wanted and could be turned in for a bounty. But Mizu firmly states that she would rather fight than get married. Now that they are out of cash though, the old woman returns to her life of prostitution and gaslights Mizu for not being willing to make sacrifices for her mother as she is doing for her. This greatly bothers our protagonist and she finally accepts to get married. Upon arrival at Mikio's place, Mizu intentionally makes a sly comment about the man's age, but he doesn't think much of it and requests that they proceed with the rite of inclusion. As soon as the ceremony is over, Mikio immediately steps outside to continue with his chores. Her fake mother then suggests she prepares herself for her first night with Mikio. By the end of the day, Mizu is in their bedroom dreadfully bracing herself for a night of unwanted intimacy. But to her utmost surprise, Mikio gently whispers the words, I'm not a brute, into her ears, then slowly drags his half of the mattress to the other side of the room so she can sleep with ease. Mizu is not sure how to feel about this. The next day, while Mikio is training a particularly stubborn horse called Kai, Mizu piques some interest in the activity and decides to join him, but accidentally hits a bucket which startles the horse, annoys Mikio and leaves Mizu feeling embarrassed. Later that day, she tries cooking, and given her proficiency with the sword, chopping up the vegetables seemed easy and even fun, but Mizu has no idea how much seasoning is required and empties the container into the pot. At the table, Mikio almost chokes after tasting the meal, but doesn't say anything and simply returns to his horses. The fake mom angrily signals Mizu to go apologize. So Mizu goes outside and the couple engage in a friendly discussion. The next day Mizu cooks again. The food still tastes like shit but this time Mikio lets out a gentle laugh to ease the tension. But seriously now, I don't understand why Mizu is so bad at cooking. I mean did the sword father do all the cooking while she was living with him? Anyway Mizu notices this and soon everyone is laughing at the table. Afterward Mizu convinces Mikio to stop giving her fake mother cash for opium. This greatly displeases the old hag. From that day onward, Mizu gradually begins to feel at home with Mikio. He lets her train Kai and they go on horse rides together. The two genuinely begin to have fun with each other and after all this time of living in anger, Mizu is finally happy. Eventually she falls in love with Mikio. So one evening after kissing him, the two of them finally get intimate for the first time. The next day, Mizu opens up to Mikio about how she previously had to dress like a man and even learned how to use a sword because she wanted to take revenge against her father for her blue eyes and the death of her mother. Perplexed by this revelation, Mikio asks her to show him all her moves and she reluctantly agrees. Unfortunately for the couple though, this is where everything would come crumbling down. During their spa, Mikio used a naginata while Mizu handled the sword. For the first round, both of them play nice and Mikio easily brings her down. But overwhelmed by the thrill of using her sword again, Mizu begins pushing in more aggressively and after some amazing display of skill from both parties, Mizu eventually overcomes her husband. She then kisses Mikio but in a burst of emotion, the man goes out of character by abruptly pushing her, calling her a monster and leaving. A distraught Mizu returns home and meets her fake mother smoking opium. The woman chastises her for screwing up the marriage she worked hard to arrange. Mizu then heads to her room to wear some makeup, hoping to appeal to her husband when he returns. But the first people to arrive are a group of soldiers who have come to eliminate Mizu because apparently her fake mother who had stopped seeing the importance of the marriage ever since they stopped giving her money for opium decided to give Mizu up for the bounty on her head. As she gets ready for the battle though, Mikio returns and sees the situation. At first, Mizu is relieved at his arrival, but when he rides away without showing any sign of supporting her, she is greatly saddened. But this sadness immediately turns into rage and in no time, Mizu covers the ground with the guts of her assailants. Just then, Mikio arrives with a sword in hand, saying he rushed back to help her. Mizu asks if he was the one who sold her out, but he denies it and accuses her fake mother since she was able to buy opium, even though they are 
had stopped giving her money for it. She also denies the allegation and claims she was able to afford the opium by selling herself at the bridge again. She also reminds Mizu that she is her mother, a blatant lie, and berates Mikio for being a weak man. The two of them get into an argument that soon gets physical and Mikio pulls out a knife. Not sure who she can trust anymore, Mizu turns around to walk away, but the dying scream of the woman she called mother enrages her one last time as she throws a dagger straight at Mikio, seemingly putting an end to his life too. With this, Mizu returns to her quest for vengeance, having nothing else to lose but herself. One thing is for certain though, these guys are in some deep shit. Now we are at the main story. This is where the season actually begins. Some time has passed and Mizu, still under the guise of a man, is a lot more experienced now. She tails a man in possession of a gun to a restaurant. The man is a flesh trader, someone who buys and sells young women into prostitution. After having a meal at the place, the man picks offense with Ringo, the restaurant's chef, and soon pulls out his gun. At the sight of the gun, Mizu steps in and asks how he got the western weapon. When he threatens to shoot her, she skillfully cuts off two of his fingers with a knife. Now trembling in pain, the flesh trader reveals that he bought the gun from a man called Heiji Shindo. Mizu then shows him her blue eyes. When she's about to leave, the man calls her an Onryo, a type of Japanese demon. So as punishment, Mizu cuts off two more of his fingers before leaving. Ringo is amazed by everything and packs his things to follow her. He soon catches up to her and begs to become her apprentice. Looking at her blue eyes, he states that he too is deformed and would do anything to overcome his predicament and become a samurai like her. Mizu wants nothing to do with him so she ties him up before leaving. Soon she reaches Kyoto and goes into a temple where she performs a Shinto prayer for her mission on the sword father. Here we find out that Mizu has successfully eliminated one of the four white men she's after. Afterwards, she bribes her way into the main city in search of the Shindo Dojo, which is owned by Heiji Shindo's brother. After getting lost a couple of times and catching a glance of Princess Akemi of Kyoto, she eventually gets the right directions from some hookers at a brothel and realizes that Ringo had been secretly following her all along, so she pays the woman to keep him occupied for three days. After some more trekking, she reaches the gate of the Shindo Dojo claiming to have a message for the master, so they let her in. Once inside though, she's only met by the assistant master, who tells her she can't meet the master himself, and when she refuses to leave without seeing him, the student begin attacking her, but she easily dispatches them so the assistant master joins in, but even he isn't able to stop her. They then call the dojo's best student who Mizu instantly recognizes as Taigen, one of the kids who almost bullied her to death, and he too recognizes her. Taigen seems to be giving Mizu some trouble, so she releases the weights on her hands and feet and quickly incapacitates him. Before she can finish him off though, the master of the dojo finally comes out. He tells her where she can find Heiji Shindo and one Abijah Fowler, the white man he is hiding. As she is about to leave, Taigen calls her a dog so she cuts off his ponytail as a goodbye note. Some time later, the dojo master goes to tell his brother about Mizu, so Abijah Fowler suggests they send a group of assassins called the Four Fangs to eliminate her. Meanwhile, Mizu is taking a bath and tending to her injuries, when Ringo, who had yet again been following her, finds her completely naked and realizes she's a woman. In the second episode, Mizu is still trying to get rid of Ringo and threatens to eliminate him if he continues to follow her, but after he helps her get into a town whose guards don't take bribes, they end up walking together. Ringo then promises to keep her true gender a secret and manages to convince Mizu to take him in as an apprentice. Soon they reach the town square and see the people having a purification event called the Hadaka Matsuri. As a result of this, no one with the boat is willing to take them to their next destination that day, so they decide to spend the night in the town. Mizu persuades Ringo to stay and have fun while she heads to the mountains to take a bath and train. Taigen, who had been trailing her for revenge, spots her but maintains a good distance to study his opponent. By evening, the assassins also catch up to her and an intense battle ensues. With some insane moves and well-timed attacks, Mizu manages to take them out one after the other. When only their leader remains, she realizes he is the same assassin who had lied to get a sword from the swordfather all those years ago, the blood soaked Chiaki. By this point though, Mizu had already received some serious injuries, so she struggles when fighting the assassin. She also gets distracted when she spots Taigen and gets slashed. Chiaki notices her weak state and goes in for the kill, but Mizu tosses her sword backward impaling him in midair. Mizu's sword must be a lightsaber to pass through all that armor. Eventually though, the soaked Chiaki dies. Taigen then emerges and requests a duel. Mizu agrees but collapses from her injuries before the fight can even begin. Taigen contemplates killing her right there but decides to wait for her to recover to get a proper duel instead. 
Just before Taigen can discover her true gender though, Ringo rushes in and tackles him to the ground before picking Mizu up. Taigen tells Ringo about a nearby temple and the trio take shelter there. After receiving some treatment, Mizu confronts Taigen and the two agree to have a proper duel in three days. The next day, Heiji Shindo sends his giant henchman with a letter inviting Mizu for tea. Taigen believes it's a trap but Mizu instantly agrees so he decides to go with her to make sure she survives. After some horse riding, they stop near their venue. Mizu and Taigen advise to the location while Ringo and the giant stay behind. Mizu and Taigen meet Heiji Shindo and, after some deliberation, Heiji Shindo reveals that he had grown tired of working with a white man and provides Mizu with two options. She would either lose her right thumb, accept a boatload of money, become the new lord of an entire province and forget about killing Abaija Fowler, or Heiji Shindo would sneak her into their fortress in an empty barrel of sake from which she can emerge and assassinate Fowler. But then she would have to work out how to escape herself. Kind of a shitty deal if you ask me. Taigen vehemently disagrees with the second option since it's obviously a suicide mission and he wants to be the one to kill Mizu himself. Mizu also knows that Heiji Shindo just wants to get rid of her so she refuses both offers. Heiji Shindo on the other hand reveals that he has a hundred archers ready to shoot at his command and tries to force Mizu into the barrel. When she tries to leave, he grabs her so she cuts off his hand. People really need to learn to let this girl go whenever she wants. Anyway, the archers immediately begin shooting. Mizu and Taigen block some of the arrows and try to escape but Taigen Taigen gets shot on his leg. He then suggests Mizu use his body as a shield against arrows to escape but before any of them can die though, Ringo rides in on a horse and saves them. Mizu finally acknowledges Ringo's usefulness. After going some distance, Mizu knocks Taigen out and leaves with Ringo. When he wakes up, he's captured by the giant and delivered to Heiji Shindo and Abaija Fowler to be tortured for info on Mizu but Taigen refuses to talk. In the next episode, Mizu is spotted by Princess Takemi, who ran away from home in search of Taigen because she was engaged to him. Mizu goes to the brothel where Fowler's hookers usually come from, hoping to learn a way to secretly get into Heiji Shindo's fortress. Akemi then gets a job there so she can confront Mizu about Taigen's whereabouts. Mizu meets the brothel owner, Madame Kaji, who agrees to give Mizu the information she seeks if she can assassinate someone for her. It turns out Madame Kaji's favorite girl, Kinuyo, was forcefully taken away from her by a very powerful man, Boss Hamada. Kaji wants Mizu to assassinate Kinuyo to end her misery, and it must look like an accident. Later that night, Akemi enters Mizu's room with the bright idea of poisoning her, but Mizu instantly recognizes her and subdues her before going for Madame Kaji's job. Mizu then uses some ninja moves to get into Hamada's castle. She manages to assassinate the girl and make it look like an accident, but is seen by a little kid outside when she grieves for Kinuyo. She lets the boy escape, but he later snitches to Boss Hamada, who brings his thousand claw gang to kill everyone and burn down Madame Kaji's building. After receiving numerous injuries from the thousand claw in a lengthy and deadly brawl, Mizu manages to eliminate all of them leaving Hamada himself for Madame Kaji and her girls. When she's about to leave, some soldiers sent by Akemi's father arrive to retrieve the annoying brats. Mizu who is already exhausted rightfully decides not to stop them. Akemi who thinks everyone should kiss her ass yells Mizu's name as she's being taken back to Kyoto. Ringo is also mad at Mizu for some dumbass reason so he leaves. I mean, what the hell was she supposed to do? Kill some innocent soldiers who just want to take Akemi back to the safety of her home? F you, Ringo! In the sixth episode, Mizu arrives at Heiji Shindo's fortress alone, and after saying grace, she proceeds to enter the secret tunnel Madame Kaji had told her about, and eventually finds herself inside the building. Using some more ninja skills, she quietly takes out a few of the guards, but one of them sees blood on the floor and sounds the alarm, earning himself the slice of his life. From here, Mizu pushes her way to the top of the building to find Abaija Fowler, passing through some real crazy shit along the way. She survives a bunch of booby traps, fights and defeats a dozen soldiers and literally gets intoxicated by a monkey. <laughs> I mean what the fuck? While intoxicated, she fights some not so real monsters, finds and rescues Taigen and finally fights Heiji's giant and somehow manages to win. She then hangs Taigen on her back, climbs up the wall and crashes into Fowler's room, where she sees his plans to overthrow the Shogun. Before she can locate him though, Fowler quickly picks up a gun and shoots at her. The bullet breaks her sword and hits her in the shoulder. When Taigen tries to help, Fowler proceeds to beat the crap out of the two weak heroes. Seeing the futility of the situation, Mizu picks up one piece of her broken 
broken sword and grabs Tygen before jumping out the window, crashing into the ice water. And as usual, just before they drown, Ringo appears and saves them yet again. Ringo is then somehow able to carry both Mizu and Tygen all the way from Heiji Shindo's fortress in the ice ridden Tanabe Island to the sword father's home in Kohama village with a freaking wheelbarrow. Now, I've never been to any of these places before, but Chad GPT estimates the distance between Kohama and Tanabe Island to be over 2000 kilometers and even if he had a horse, it would still take him about 5 days to complete this journey, not to mention all the guards blocking each city. But what's funny is, the show makes it look like he reached Kohama the very next morning. While Ringo is to speed Sir Theories aside, the sword father lets them in and after some days, the injured begin to move around, with Ringo still mad at Mizu for not helping Akemi kill 3 innocent soldiers who probably had families by the way. She and Taigen get to talking one day and end up playing on the floor. This ends up exciting the both of them, so Mizu quickly gets off of him. Still believing Mizu to be a man, Taigen blames his boner on Akemi's absence. <laughs> yeah, sure Taigen, we believe you. Mizu then tells Taigen about Akemi coming to look for him and Fowler's plan to kill the Shogun and forcefully take over Japan with small gold guns. Taigen is then mad at Mizu for not saying anything sooner and storms off. Honestly, only the sword father ever had a good reason to be mad at Mizu in this whole anime. Later that day when she's feeling depressed and about to give up on her mission, the sweet old swordsmith gives Mizu a heartfelt speech about art, which gives her enough drive to reforge her broken sword whose other two pieces somehow followed her to Kohama and perform the hardest purification ritual I've ever seen on uh, Netflix. The next day, she bids her old master goodbye and heads to Kyoto along with Ringo to stop Abijah Fowler once and for all. This time, the sword father doesn't say anything, as though sensing the end of the first season. Mizu reaches the shogun's castle and meets Madame Kaji, who had come to attend Akemi's wedding to the shogun's son. She warns the woman about Abijah Fowler's imminent arrival and tells her to leave before moving on. Soon, she comes across Akemi and her tutor, Seki, and saves them. The ungrateful Akemi is still mad at Mizu, but our protagonist has no time for spoiled kids and tells them how to escape because Fowler had already arrived with a horde of gunned soldiers. After some hassle, Fowler manages to break into the castle with Heiji Shindo's help. Soon, he finds and kills the Shogun in front of Taigen, Ringo and the king's entire court. Before he can kill anyone else though, Mizu jumps in and saves the day. She then pulls some bullet time moves straight out of the matrix while the others escape. Taigen stays back to help kill Fowler's men since they had apparently forgotten how to use their guns. Fowler tries escaping but is soon cornered by Mizu and Taigen. The battle commences but Taigen is quickly incapacitated, so when Fowler tries escaping again, Mizu has to face him alone. Their fight is a very intense one best experienced first hand, and when Fowler realizes that he is about to die, he tells her that only he can take her to London where she can find the other two candidates for the role of her dad. He also tells her that the woman who raised her wasn't her mother, and even though he probably isn't her father either, the other two in London are more likely to be, seeing that she truly would not be able to find them on her own, Mizu decides to keep him alive for now. The final time we see Mizu in season 1 of Blue Eye Samurai is on a ship with Abijah Fowler caged in the cargo hold heading to England. Somehow she was able to drag a full grown white man to a ship without being seen by anyone. Now that we are done with Mizu's story, let's talk about her personality. The first thing I'd like to say about Mizu is that she likes to act tough but in reality, she's a fun loving person who isn't really as hard and stoic as she portrays herself to be. Conflict is something Mizu had always hated. This was evident in the scene of her as a baby. Even while growing up, all Mizu ever wanted was to go out and play with the other kids. Since she couldn't do that, she settled for her fake mother. And you can actually see the two of them having some fun. A more recent example example of Mizu's fun loving side can be seen in the scene where she's playing around rolling on the floor with Taigen. I mean just look how happy she was. Only when Taigen made everything awkward did she finally get off and resume her tough guy act. Now don't get me wrong here. I'm not saying that she isn't a strong character because she really is and with good reason too. You see, assuming Mizu had grown up normally with siblings, maybe some friends to hang out with, yeah, she probably would have been the most cheerful person to exist in the Edo period because that is all Mizu craves, that is all she had ever wanted and that is exactly the reason why she's so angry at her father because he was the person who denied her all of these things. The blue eyes she got from him made people call her a monster on sight. That shit really got to 
her and eventually she came to the realization that no one would ever accept her for who she was. She believed that she could never be treated normally so she accepted that fate and emotionally built a shell around herself, choosing a life of solitude, pushing away everyone she comes across and not giving them a chance to hurt her. That is why she acts so hard. It's not something she enjoys doing and would definitely prefer anything else but she knows better than to appear vulnerable before the same people who tried to kill her as a kid. This is why her time with Mikio was extremely monumental for her emotionally. The first time they met each other, even though his approach was kind of nice, her reply was rather smug. You're not as hideous as I expected. You're much older than I expected. Huh? That was her emotional shell talking, telling her to show no weakness no matter what. And since she didn't know what kind of man he was, she had already mentally prepared herself for whatever insult he was gonna hurl at her. And with what she said to him, she also expected him to lose it and immediately send her back. But Mikio was built different, and eventually she started loosening an up around him, expressing her gentle nature. Another thing about Mizu is her strong sense of loyalty. Her severe longing for friends as a kid made her a very loyal one to the few she got as an adult. The only thing I think Mizu can place over her friendship is her thirst for revenge. This is why she is so stingy with her trust, because she knows that once she gets close to someone, she can do anything to maintain that bond. It took forever for her to accept Ringo as an apprentice, and Mizu only let Akemi get taken because she wasn't close enough to her yet. And even then, she felt bad for her. Taigin's case is quite special, because even though he almost killed her as a kid, he would later save her life and even get tortured because of her. The sword father probably holds the most precious spot in her heart though, but even then she left him to go get her revenge. Just as she is loyal to her friends, Mizu also feels extremely bad when they are mad at her. That is why she felt her worst when Ringo and Taigin were mad at her in episode 7. Mizu is also a very kind-hearted person. If she ever sees someone in a bad situation she can help out, she will at least try to do her best to help. When she was younger, she selflessly helped the sword father carry the meat to your home. And later when the assassin came lying to get a sword from the sword father, Mizu was truly touched and related to his story and was even angry with the sword father when he was skeptical about the man. She helped the mother who wasn't let into Kyoto with Taigin's golden hairpiece. She gave one of the street musicians she saw at Kanazawa a tip much to his appreciation. Even though she assassinated Kinuyo, Mizu was devastated by the act and almost broke down for killing the innocent girl. At the same place, she let the boy who saw her escape. Letting the guards take Akemi back to Kyoto was also an act of kindness, in my opinion, because her very next mission was to raid Heiji Shindo's fortress, so there really wasn't any place for Akemi with her anyway. But what makes this trait of hers especially selfless is the fact that the people People she's been kind to are the same people who wouldn't hesitate to call her a demon the moment they see her blue eyes. Another thing worth noting about Mizu is her exceptional intelligence and photographic memory. This girl got excellent at sword fighting mainly by watching other people practice. The fact that she wasn't born with any extraordinary skills and didn't just become as good as she became overnight is just so refreshing. I like that she had to work extra hard to reach where she is currently. We got to see her face many challenges and sometimes she has to think outside the box to emerge victorious. She usually has to persevere in battles and winning never comes easily. But the more people she encounters, the more she learns. I also mentioned her having a photographic memory, because once Mizu sees someone, she never forgets their face. She instantly recognized Taigen and the blood-soaked Chiaki from her childhood, and Princess Akemi too, who she had only slightly seen before. When it comes to social skills though, Mizu is as smooth as sandpaper, and rightfully so. You don't expect someone who has practically been ostracized from society her entire life to be good at communication. A lot of times we can notice Mizu kind of freezing up in situations where she's typically supposed to respond to someone. When she was younger, she hardly ever even spoke at all. Her time with the sword father really gave her a sense of self, and she learned how to open up a lot more, but she was still very much reserved. But what absolutely gets Mizu by surprise all the time is when someone does or says something nice to her. She is so used to being maltreated that even the simplest compliments get her off guard. And I just have to say, little Mizu has to be the bravest, most adorable little girl I've seen in a while. Her pure innocence and humility really touched my heart and I'm always so glad when I remember that she grew up with a sword father who was nice and caring. She really deserved it. 
Finally for this chapter, I'd like to talk about Mizu's stubbornness because this girl is extremely strong headed. When she sets out to do something, you better believe no one can stop her. Like when she was little, even with all the warnings and prohibitions from her fake mother about going outside, Mizu eventually did which led to the burning down of their house. In her adult years, the stubbornness translated into determination, primarily for her revenge and it was with this stubborn determination that she ended season 1, when she chose to board a ship to London, a place she had never even heard of before to find and annihilate her remaining targets. From a logical standpoint, this was a terrible idea because I assume Mizu cannot speak English, so Abijah Fowler can easily get her arrested in London. But for now, Mizu doesn't give a fuck. London, here we come. Now let's talk about Mizu's love life. Ooh. I am aware that a lot of people would prefer if romance wasn't incorporated into Mizu's journey because it might ruin everything, but I strongly disagree with this notion. I believe love is a major driving force that when implemented properly can give our hero's journey more meaning. In fact, I think Blue Eye Samurai made a huge mistake with the way it handled the Mikio story arc. Like I said before, the initial reason why Mizu set out on her revenge mission was to avenge the death of her mother. So after finding out that her mother was still alive and kicking, she was ready to forget about everything and settle down with the woman. But things went sideways when the old hag gave her out for marriage. The show then went out of its way to portray Mikio as a kind and caring man who had no issues with her biraciality, only to turn him into a pathetic douchebag at the very end, then have Mizu kill him and return on her revenge mission. The problem with this is who or what is she now avenging? Because unlike the last time when she thought soldiers hunting her down burnt her mother alive, this time Mikio was the one who killed her mom. And she killed Mikio. So what is the point of her revenge mission now? Now she just kinda feels like an edgy serial killer with daddy issues. Because at this point, it's almost as if she just wants to kill her father for giving birth to her. But imagine if this is what happened. She overcomes Mikio during their spa. He gets angry, calls her a monster and leaves, right? But he soon realizes his mistake takes and returns home, seeing Mizu in trouble. He immediately jumps in to support her, but amidst the battle, one of the bad guys fatally stabs Mikio. Just before he dies, he apologizes to Mizu for his previous weakness, encourages her to be a better samurai than he was and tells her he loves her before dying. Mizu is utterly devastated and proceeds to wipe out all the guards before getting back to her revenge journey. And just like that, Mikio would have become a fan favorite character and Mizu's mission would have become even more meaningful because yet again, her father's actions have led to the death of someone she loves and this time the only man who ever truly loved her for who she was. Tell me this wouldn't have been better than the weak reason the writers gave to put her back on the road to revenge. For an amazing story like Blue Eye Samurai, the end of Mikyu has to be what almost ruined it all for me. As for Taigen, well he did try to bash her face in as a kid, but then there were only kids back then, so you can't really hold that against him. Also one flashback also showed that he didn't really like the way Mizu was treated, but you know, peer pressure and whatnot. And as an adult, Taigen is a completely different person who actually cares about others. In the scene where he and Mizu were about to be killed by the rain of arrows, after he gets shot on the leg, he tells Mizu to use him as a shield and run to safety. That way at least one of them would survive. Hell with it. Hold me over your head and run. No reason for us both to die. If that's not selfless, then I don't know what is. Overall, I think Taigen has done enough good to redeem himself, and we already know that they have chemistry for each other. Perhaps something good can come out of their relationship in the future, especially now that Akemi has chosen power over freedom with him. I guess the last candidate would be Ringo. I mean, I'm not really expecting this to happen, but if Mizu does end up in a romantic relationship with Ringo, it would be absolutely crazy, like freaking insane and completely unexpected. What do you guys think about Mizu and Ringo? Mingu? <laughs> I would pay good money to see that. Well, there is also the slight possibility of her meeting someone in London. But given her current hatred towards her European side, I think it would take a miracle for Mizu to grow any form of affection for an Englishman. But hey, that's just what I think. Who knows what the show's writers, Amber Noizumi and Michael Green have in store for us. After all, they are a biracial couple themselves. My point here is that Mizu has had too much of a hard life already and I feel like a happy ending with her in love would be a perfect way for her to rest. After such a rough life full of hate, I believe she deserves some peace of mind with someone she loves. There is nothing wrong with true love guys, don't let hate cloud your minds. And 
that's basically all I have to say about Mizu for now. Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to hit the like button and drop a comment. Always remember to take care, stay safe, and I'll see you all in the next video. All right now, ciao.